A very good afternoon to all of you. It gives me great pleasure to warmly invite all of you present here today and those of you joining us online to witness the launch of books authored by our fellow colleagues and experts catering to timely leads in medical education and a comprehensive discussion on teaching basic sciences. Doing dignitaries to mark the commencement of this historic occasion with traditional lighting of the oil lamp. Our chief guest this afternoon, Professor in Anatomy and Consultant Radiologist at the Department of Anatomy, Faculty of Medical Sciences, the University of Sri Jayavadanapura, and President of the Anatomical Society of Sri Lanka, Professor Harsha Disanayaka. Professor in Medical Education at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, and Chairperson of the SLMA Expert Committee on Medical Education, Professor Indika Karnathilaka, Senior Professor of Anatomy and Dean of the Faculty of Dental Sciences at the University of Sri Jayavadanapura, Professor Surangi Yasavardana, Professor in Urology and Consultant Surgeon at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, Professor Ajit Malalasekara, Professor in Anatomy and Consultant of Palmologist at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, Professor Madhuanti Disanayaka, former Registrar of the Sri Lanka Medical Council, Dr. Chandanatha Pattu, Senior Lecturer in Anatomy at the Faculty of Medical Sciences at the University of Sri Jayavardhanapura, and Convener of the SLMA Expert Committee on Medical Education, Dr. Sajit Ediri Singha. And may I also invite a medical student from the audience to light the oil lamp. Thank you. May I invite the following dignitaries to grace us at the head table? Our chief guests this evening, Professor Harsha Disanayaka, Professor Indika Karunathilaka, and Dr. Sajit Ediri Singha. Thank you. Once again, a very good evening to all of you and a warm welcome to the webinar on a timely topic in medical education and the launch of two publications by two of our very own council members, Professor Indika Karunathilaka and Dr. Sajit Ediri Singha. Medical education is an evolving field that requires timely intervention to meet societal needs and scientific advances. Therefore, while teaching and learning strategies that best suit each discipline varies, with time, teaching and learning strategies adopted within these disciplines also require gradual change. So we are gathered here today to discuss the current trends in, base, in teaching basic sciences and commemorate the launch of student-centered resource material to facilitate the learning process. So first, firstly, 
Let me kindly invite the chairperson of the SLMA Expert Committee on Medical Education and Professor in Medical Education at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, Professor Indika Karna Telaka, to deliver the opening remarks. Professor Harsha Disanayaka, Professor in Anatomy, Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Jayawardenepura. All other distinguished invitees, professors, senior professors, representing departments of anatomy and basic sciences uh, from faculties of medicine, senior professor Surangi Yasavardhana, also representing the accreditation of Sri Lanka Medical Council, council members and uh, members of Sri Lanka Medical Association who are joining in person as well as online, dear students. On behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association Expert Committee on Medical Education, I warmly welcome all of you for this very important and historic occasion. I am mentioning this as a historic occasion due to two reasons. One, firstly, this marks another collaborative activity between Sri Lanka Medical Association and faculties of medicine in improving the quality and relevance of medical education. Secondly, why I am mentioning this as very timely was with the recent developments in medical education, especially with the recently concluded World Federation of Medical Education visit to Sri Lanka for accreditation, which actually makes a landmark in medical education in Sri Lanka because the recognition of medical degrees in Sri Lanka depends on this accreditation visit. This visit was concluded last week. And during this visit, the local review team has gone through the Colombo curriculum, how it is implemented in detail during the accreditation exercise and the WFME review team uh, was observing and assessing the accreditation process. And during that activity, a uh, lot of discussions were made related to uh, improving the relevance and the application of basic science teaching. And more emphasis was made on the need for integration, especially based on the remarks by the local review team. A Lot of good work has been done, especially Many of you who are here have been pioneers in improving the quality and relevance, in uh, improving the quality and relevance of teaching basic sciences in Sri Lanka. So I think we have to carry forward all this good work, the excellent work that has been done. So the idea of this seminar and the book launch is to support and to be supplementary to the excellent work that has been done so far by the departments, basic science departments uh, in our faculties. And ultimately, our goal is to improve the quality of medical education in the country. And ultimately, the society and the patients and country should benefit. And that is more so important during time period like that, in a challenging time period where we have to really strive for improving the quality and relevance. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now, may I warmly invite our chief guest this evening, Professor in Anatomy and Consultant Radiologist at the Department of Anatomy at the Faculty of Medical Sciences, the University of Sri Jayavadanapura, and President of the Anatomical Society of Sri Lanka, Professor Harsha Disanayaka, to enlighten us on current trends in teaching basic sciences and share practice points to improve the effectiveness of teaching.
many times. But they did. Please come down here. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Professor Sanat Dharmaratna, President SLME, Professor Ishan Soisa, Secretary SLME, uh, joining online, Senior Professor Surangi Asavardhana, Professor Indika Karnatilaka, and Dr. Sajit Edir Singha, the authors of the books to be launched today, dear students, uh, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me as the chief guest. I'm honored and privileged to be here as the president of the Anatomical Society of Sri Lanka at this important event. Uh, Anatomical Society of Sri Lanka, established in 2011, has brought anatomists and all those who with a special interest in anatomy together to achieve a common objective. Anatomy has always been a cornerstone in medicine. I'm particularly pleased to see that the expert committee on medical education SLMA headed by Professor Indika and the team giving due recognition to the basic sciences. I congratulate Dr. Sajit Edir Singha and Professor Indika Karnatilaka for compiling the books that will be launched today. I'm sure they will be of immense benefit to the learners of anatomy, both in medical and allied health fields. The books highlight the core areas in anatomy in a simplified form with emphasis on clinical relevance. It also focuses on radiological anatomy, which will be of much use to the future doctors. Right. I'll be uh, talking on current trends in teaching radiological anatomy. Anatomy 
is the branch of biological biology concerned with the study of the structure of the human body and its parts. The word anatomy is derived from Greek and means to cut up or cut open, where we used to practice from good old days in teaching and learning anatomy with dissections to examine the relationship among structures of the body along with the structure of the individual organs. We discuss anatomy in five divisions commonly, gross anatomy, where we study the structures, microscopic anatomy, developmental anatomy, imaging anatomy, and genetics. Radiological anatomy or imaging anatomy is where the human anatomy knowledge meets clinical practice. It involves several methods of visualizing the internal structures of the human body, like X-ray, ultrasound scanning, CT scanning, and MRI. When we study the vascular tree by dissecting, we see all these vascular structures. The same thing can be studied with imaging. The picture here is a angiogram of the distal aorta and the, the lower limbs where you can see the same structures what we saw when we dissect. Similarly, these are sections of brain, axial, sagittal, and coronal, where we dissected and see for ourselves. And this is how they correlate with MRI scans. So with the present day imaging, we see the same thing correlating with what we saw with dissections. In neuroanatomy, we studied the ascending descending tracks. Here, this picture, the diagram shows the pyramidal tracts arising from the motor cortex, descending down through the internal capsule and descending down further as the pyramidal tracts. Now, these things actually were more sort of, uh, in theory, we studied, but nowadays, these images shows the targeted tachography of the corticospinal tracts, where you see the actual pathway of these tracts highlighted in these MRI tractographies, which is more practical and realistic. Coming into the more applied aspects of imaging anatomy, where the passing out doctors should know. These are some images of a stroke patient you might see. The first image is a normal CT scan of the brain. Here you see an infarcted area and this is a hemorrhage. For a first contact doctor, it is essential to have this core knowledge. S same way, 
the brain hemorrhages. Now, the first one is a extradural hemorrhage. This is a, sub, a subarachnoid hemorrhage and a subdural. Again, a basic doctor practicing at the accident service or an emergency unit will see and should be able to identify. Again, from what we see for ourselves, these are the, the bones, the skeletal uh, elements. The same thing can be seen in the x-rays. And also, the learner can easily grasp the normal anatomy and also a step forward this picture shows a fracture neck of femur where the learning doctor should be able to spot. Uh, this is a short video clip on ultrasound scanning where you see how the ultrasound scanning is being done and the importance of it in evaluating the real-time images. Uh, the, the sounds are not coming, but never mind. Now, this is the, uh, on the left side, left hypochondrial region, the spleen, this is the diaphragm. You can see the movements, the diaphragmatic movements with breathing. This is the kidney inferior to the spleen. And you can see the real time imaging with ultrasound scanning. Nowadays, the ultrasound scanning is, is applicable in day to day practice in the wards. In the current day practice, especially with uh, with uh, dengue fever, probably it's important to spot the uh, leakage phase. And uh, even in the, the the clinics, in the urology clinics, you might see the patient coming with renal colic. It's the simple uh, investigation where you put the scanner and see. So coming into the experiences at uh, University of Sri Javadanapura Department of Anatomy, uh, what you see here is the students are dissecting and we have encouraged students to use the tabs, the, the IT knowledge and the expertise and the skills of the new generation are utilized effectively to see and associate with the dissections where they utilize uh, uh, ebooks and also we use these uh, three dimensional software we have in order to strengthen and further highlight the dissections before dissections you see here uh, how the skull based structures are being demonstrated with the 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 new uh, the 3d imaging and also in dissections the cross sections are correlated with the uh, the images we have a x-ray lab where uh, we demonstrate how the patients are being positioned and how the x-rays are being uh, taken right and uh, further, that will uh, enhance the understanding of the, the X-ray images. Not only that, the, we have got an ultrasound scanner in the Department of Anatomy. We teach them the, the importance and we demonstrate the, the applications of ultrasound scanning 
and uh, real-time anatomy in small group discussions with the students uh, demonstrating uh, to them. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's important for us to incorporate imaging anatomy in current day teaching to emphasize what we teach students and it's in vogue that we take a step forward change in our curricula to further strengthen the imaging anatomy aspects. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now may I invite Professor Indika Karunathelaka, the Professor in Medical Education at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, and Chairperson of the SLMA Expert Committee on Medical Education to share with us his expertise on teaching basic sciences. Thank you. Uh, during this presentation, uh, I'll be referring uh, to uh, how to make teaching and learning of basic sciences simpler, more effective, and enjoyable. And uh, this, again, uh, would be very much linked to the presentation uh, by Professor Harshadi Sanayaka. Uh, so, yeah. If we take the, the traditional approach, we are the explosion of information, the amount of information uh, that we try to impart on students is ever increasing. And it is becoming more and more with the, with the ever increasing quantum of knowledge. And sometimes can be even beyond the capacity of human brain. And if we take the burden that we place on the medical students, it's far too heavy. This was recognized not only now, but long ago, even in late 19th century. That has led to a statement by the General Medical Council that we are actually breaking the intellectual backbone of the students. And sometimes the content overload in our curricula can be so much that the students might fail to see the trees in the woods, so to say. Sometimes we say that the students don't know the basics. But on the other hand, there may be fingers pointing us at us as well, as teachers. Are we teaching them too much? And when it comes to basic sciences, is there an erosion of basic science knowledge? When the students go to the wards, I think students are here. They can remember how many times the clinicians told them that you don't know the basics. That has been there when we were students and it is the same now also. And research has actually shown that as time goes on, there's a considerable knowledge loss among medical students in the basic sciences as time goes on. And it is more so when they move up towards the clinical years. Again, there's 
lot of research worldwide conducted which has shown that the core basic science knowledge is lost during the clinical years. So it is not something that's unique to Sri Lanka. Worldwide, it has been the same. Again, research has shown that students are competent when they are being asked questions in written examinations. They can answer them. However, when they are being asked the same questions in the clinical context, they usually don't perform that well. Again, this may be all of our personal experience, but research also has shown. So is this an issue? Is this an issue? Again, research has shown that when it comes to clinical reasoning, the knowledge of basic sciences plays a huge role. But it may not be the same way that the clinicians may be basically working out the clinical reasoning. They may not be working out from the very basics. It's a very complex process of reasoning where basic science knowledge plays an important role. Because again, research has shown that there's a very positive correlation, strongly positive correlation between the retained basic science knowledge and the clinical knowledge. Again, research has shown that. Therefore, I think it's very important how we need to continuously strive on making basic science simpler, more effective and enjoyable. The departments of medical education have been working in very close collaboration with the basic science departments and there was a very fruitful and very cordial relationship between the basic science departments toward this end. So, on the other hand, what are those basic sciences? The very conventional view, the flexionarian view is that it refers to anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry. Generally, that is the viewpoint. If we take the, the traditional curriculum approach, the first two years are conducted like basic sciences. On the other hand, areas like statistics or psychology or sociology, can they be basic sciences? Now, if you take pathology, it's termed a, a paraclinical subject. Can it be a part, part of basic sciences when it comes to relevance? The current conventional view, however, is basically the three main subjects. So how can we improve this relevance? This is where the cognitive neurosciences, the understanding of how the brain functions and the, the psychology, understanding of how thinking happens and the teaching best practices, all these coming together into this endeavor. And the possible strat strategies in making the basic science teaching more enjoyable, simpler. There can be several approaches. No one approach would work. One would be promoting more student-centered approach. This again was highlighted over and over again during the recent accreditation visit. Developing study skills. Because learning basic sciences, especially if you take anatomy, the content load is so high, so challenging. So you need to be equipped with proper study techniques and skills to master this huge content. The use of technology. And Link in sociology, the humane approach, humanity is into that. If we take student-centered approach, that is actually the cornerstone of many innovations in medical education. Active learning has shown to promote retention. Because again, research has shown the passive learning is the approach that leads to least retention. So, Focusing more on application and the relevance. Again, as highlighted by Professor Dishanayak also, the more practical and clinical application, probably through case-based approach, through small group learning. So rather than focusing on, say, more theoretical, rather than in what areas that may be very fascinating to us, but may not make meaning to students during that time period, what should be the meaningful approach? Again, research has shown that Students enjoy and experience teaching of basic sciences as more exciting when it is integrated with in organ system approach. Again, many medical schools in Sri Lanka have now moved into the organ system approach with clinical relevance. And many medical schools in Sri Lanka now follow the organ system based integrated approach, uh, mainly through horizontal integration, where the relevant content 
is taught at the same time in many subjects. And also bringing in the early clinical relevance and if possible, actual clinical exposure has shown enabling students to associate basic sciences with real patient situations. This again has been practiced in almost all the faculties of medicine in Sri Lanka to very next extent. How can we link the basic sciences with clinical application with normal structure and function and abnormal structure and function? So I think the teachers and the faculties have done a lot of work and probably always, always there is room for improvement. And again, as you all know, the basic science content, how students can memorize, how they can retain this huge amount of information, this huge volume of information when it comes to the basic sciences. And especially when we know, when they attend a lecture, within few hours, a lot of content is almost forgotten. About 70% is gone. So how to face this challenge? Learning skills, reading skills, especially when it comes to mastering this huge volume of content, reading skills are very, very important. Faster readers are always at an advantage, especially when they enter the med medical faculty. And some students who find it very difficult to master these skills find uh, the course very challenging. Summarizing this huge amount of information and how to memorize, how to reduce this burden of memory from the students. So all these are strategic approaches. The speed reading techniques like the SQ3R, where we teach the students to go through huge volumes of information and gather them within a very short period of time. And different strategies of summarizing information from simple listing to more complex but more effective mind mapping especially when it comes to basic sciences, the understanding can be made easier and simpler through simple classification in many areas. Or when it comes to areas like physiology, like the flow charts, where you can understand the sequence of events in a very simpler and meaningful way. Or how we can understand the full course of maybe a uh, like in circulation, sometimes we learn in piecemeal. Say we learn about say subclavian artery, we learn about brachial artery in another axillary artery in another point, and then brachial in another time point, and later try to put everything together. But do we need to get the full picture? Once you get the full picture, will the learning become easier? And how to reduce this huge burden of content? So memorization again very important. This may be a strategic approach, but in a way that will help in reducing the burden and making it a little bit more interesting. For example, using mnemonic, simple mnemonics that will reduce the burden of memory by relating that into maybe interesting life experiences. I think all of us have been using that. And the, one of the books that we are launching today, one approach is this, try to make it a little bit more interesting by using those different, different approaches. And also, Again, in reducing the huge content load, sometimes there can be simple models that we can use to understand and then apply, apply them in a generalized way. For example, we learn a lot about triangles in our bodies. So all these triangles, the simple basics of say the borders, the roof and the flow and the content may be applicable and generalizable in a very easy way so that you can basically understand the concepts in an easier way in many areas the simple VAN relationship and the triangular relationship that we learned about and the pyramid uh, model that we learned. Can we make these things simpler so that the understanding becomes easier? So these are some of the simple approaches that we have uh, tried and attempted. So the best feedback would be from the students who will be using these. Activation of prior knowledge, maybe linking to their clinical experience or maybe even linking to their uh, say, uh, real life experience. There are good musicians in this audience also. So can they link their real life experiences and they learn anatomy? And also the neurosciences. What research says is if you can activate as many parts of your brain, the learning becomes more efficient and effective. So can we uh, activate not only the auditory 
component, not only the visual, but also the meat, uh, the uh, motor context also, context, uh, cortex also, or what about the limbic, the emotional aspect, if you can bring all these together, probably the learning would be more effective and retention would be better. And this technique of mind mapping, where you can summarize a huge amount of information together so that the learning would be easier. And you can make connections because making connection is very important. The learning pyramid, where we can use all these different approaches rather than just lectures and combining those would be more effective learning. And the role of technology. Nowadays, a lot of students are very savvy with the technology. And now most of our faculties have our learning management system. But now we have time to move beyond that. The virtual reality and augmented reality to learn about three-dimensional structures and uh, relive them and understand them, interact with them. All these possibilities are available. Not only high technology, but even the low cost. And can we link with the medical humanities? Now with the cadaveric teaching, can we link that with the, with the rituals that are religious, religious rituals that are used? Or maybe link with the the religious part or the maybe the humanities part of life and death. There's a lot of medical humanities that have been in use and a lot of top level uh, artists, top level authors, they have been basically referred to medical context, which we actually we can use in teaching our uh, basic, not only basic sciences, but also medical teaching in a very more, very much interesting way. For example, we talk about Medusa's Caput Medusi and also the Achilles tendon. So all these, they coming from the Greek mythology. So can we make you all these into making our teaching more interesting and more engaging and more effective? So there's no single approach, but our ultimate target is to develop our students who have not only knowledge, but have skills and attitudes, and ultimately will be serving the community because ultimately it should be the patient and the country who should benefit. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now this brings us to a key item on the agenda this evening, the launch of the book titled Anatomy of the Lower Limb, a study companion for medical students. So without further ado, let me invite the co-authors of this publication, Professor Indika Karunathilaka and Dr. Sajid addressing her to present the very first copy of their publication to our chief guest this evening, Professor Harsha Disanayaka. Publication which stands out for its modern workbook format designed based on key principles of medical education, consisting of mnemonics and visuals to facilitate learning, similar to its first counterpart on the upper limb. Thank you, Prof. Harsh, and congratulations to both of you. Next, uh, let me invite senior lecturer in anatomy at the Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Jayavadanapura, and convener of the SLMA Expert Committee on Medical Education, Dr. Sajit Edirisingha, to share with us his experience and shed light on human tissue plastination and new methods in preservation.
Thank you, Reska. Good afternoon, everyone. So today uh, I will discuss uh, this uh, somewhat new term for us, the human tissue plastination. But uh, even though it is something a little bit new for us, but uh, for the rest of the world, it came in 1970s. So, so what is plastination? So the plastination means uh, actually we are making a human body uh, by incorporating a soluble resin and making it harder and making the human body into plastics. So that means uh, in order to decay a human body uh, for the organisms, the bacteria and the fungus, uh, they need water. So what we are doing here is we are going to remove the water and replace that water with a hardening resin and then make it harder after some time. And then we have the same anatomical structure, but it is plastic made out of plastics. So actually in simple terms, we are making plastic real human bodies. Actually this technique was uh, invented by a German scientist called Von Hagens. So this is uh, Dr. Von Hagens. Uh, his anatomy, the body world exhibition, some of you all must have visited it. So it is a very nice uh, exhibition and a gallery that you all should visit. So I will uh, teach you all about a uh, little bit basics, how we are going to make a human body into plastics. So uh, as I said, it is the basic concept is first to remove the water and then replace it with the resin. Right? So we can use these uh, epoxies or the silicon rubber or polyesters uh, for this plastination. So there are different type of tissue plastinations. One is the whole body plastination. We can, uh, as you all can see, uh, we can plastinize a human, entire human body. So this image, if you all have visited the, uh, the, the corner image with the skin, who's a person who's ha uh, having this skin on the hand, if you all have visited uh, some time back in Vedasa 2018, you all must have encountered a similar structure that we have displayed at our exhibition stall at Anatomy. So we can plastinate an entire human body. And also we can uh, do the luminal plastination. That means we can fill the cavities by injecting the resin and then uh, make it solidified. But uh, these are very fragile structures. You all can see uh, on the red color, the, the blood supply of the upper limb, the hand, and the white color structure is the bronchial tree. And this is my favorite part, the sheet plastination. So we can uh, slice the human body in whatever the section that you need, and we can go for uh, sheet plastination. So how we are going to do the plastination? So we have the expertise in Sri Lanka. We have the technique, we have the tools in Sri Lanka. It's just a matter of make it uh, going above the ground. So the, there are basic four steps. First thing is, first you need to fix this human body before it start decaying process. Then the next step is the dehydration. We need to remove the water and then we need to inject whatever the resin because we, when we are removing the water, a volume will reduce. So in order to gain that volume, we need to inject some resin into the tissue cells because I'm talking about the cellular level because the water is inside the cell cells. So we are, we are going to remove the entire 100% of water from the body that's in the cellular levels and we are replacing that resin plastics in that cell cells. So it is something like molecular work and we leave it for hardening or curing, so then we have the plastinated bodies. So the fixation uh, is the, the key important thing. So we have uh, 
we are usually use the common one, the uh, 10% formaldehyde. And then why we are using a diluted uh, percentage of uh, formaldehyde is because if you use high concentration of formalin, the body will start discoloring. You all must have encountered when we are using high concentrations of formalin in cadavers, the, the, the cadaver will become darker. And also the other most, the key, the hidden secret behind this blastination is uh, we should not use glycerin because if you use the glycerin, uh, you can't go ahead with the blastination because it will start coming out and your final outcome will be distorted. And the other uh, most important thing is uh, better to avoid phenols because the phenol will start uh, getting oxidized. Again, your cadaver will become discolored. So this is uh, the Otago uh, University where I learned this technique. Just to show you all how they are taking the slices. So the orange color kit is proximing from Department of Anatomy. So you all can see how they are going to make the uh, tissue sections. It's just five millimeter sections they are going to make. And they, it just, uh, they have adapted certain tools into the normal bandsaw where they are using the, there's a small steel box there where they uh, put the liquid nitrogen. So more cooler the specimen is, very fine and very nice sections are coming out uh, from this section. So you all can see uh, they are making a, a sections from a human head. And then we are using the dehydration uh, technique and defatting technique. Uh, we, we are basically using uh, acetones. Uh, the acetone in the sense because we first the, we can't directly inject the, this resin into the cells. So what we are going to do is uh, first we remove the water and replace that water molecule with uh, acetone. Then uh, the, the good thing with the acetone is the acetone can uh, remove the excess amount of fat in this tissue. Uh, we have to appreciate that uh, there will be a certain percentage of volume reduction as well. So here you all can see uh, these are the technical officers at that department, the Stephanie. Uh, so they are pouring uh, the acetone into these baths. So you all can see these are cooled acetones. They have uh, because the acetone will not uh, get frozen in minus 25. So they have cold, uh, frozen them. And after that, they are going to start dehydrating process. Uh, you all can see in few minutes, uh, they are how they are stacking the tissue sections that they have cut from the human head. And they are going to dip, uh, dip them uh, in these uh, acetone baths. So the acetone, we need to monitor the percentage. And then uh, by time to time, you have to replace the acetone and make it 100% clear where the, all the uh, amount of water, the, all the water molecules are uh, disappeared. So here, these are the freezers that they use. Th these are just commercial uh, freezers that we can use for this technique. So that is why I told, uh, we have the technique in Sri Lanka. So it's just a matter of uh, putting it uh, and lifting it above the ground. So here, here we have uh, put the acetones and you can see the tissue sections are coming in. So all these tissue sections are stacked together uh, and they are, because in order to make them curved and uh, to disfigure them, uh, they are going to put it in a specific manner and uh, they are going to put some more acetone and they are going for the dehydration process. So then after that, uh, we are going to go for the vacuum impregnation. So here, this is the simple machine at the gadgets that we have prepared at the Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Jawadunpur. It's a very simple thing. You all can see, it's just a, a pressure cooker and a vacuum pump where we use 
uh, for the AC repairs, air condition repairs. And we have uh, set up a separate gadget for in order to prevent uh, acetone directly coming into the pump. So we put the resin into this uh, pressure cooker and we apply the vacuum. So you all can see it is going minus 25 and the vacuum impregnation is there. So we can we have adapted this technique because now the standard technique of this plus nation is going in minus 25, but it cost us uh, as a third world country, it cost us a lot. So we have adapted for a room temperature resin casting. So after that, we go for curing. We, uh, there are specific solutions we can uh, put it. And after five weeks, you have a very nicely plasinated specimen. So the most important thing is this, even though I quickly went through this system, this uh, the entire human body to get it plasinated, it will take nearly one and a half years because it will take such a long time uh, in order to remove the water and impregnate the resin inside. So uh, Faculty of Medicine, uh, University of Sri Jawadhanapura, we have obtained the patent uh, for the tissue plasination. Professor Surangi, Yasavardhana and myself, we have the patent for the, the room temperature resin casting, so the local patent. So that is why I mentioned uh, we have the technique at the faculties I know uh, the University of Peradeniya, they also have this, uh, uh, the facilities. So we will, from the anatomical society also, uh, we will conduct several workshops in future to teach you all and share our knowledge uh, among the technical officers and the staff uh, about this new technique, the room temperature, because it is a low cost method where we can uh, go ahead and do the tissue plastination. So, most of you all must have seen this, the body world exhibition. So it is a very nice exhibition to teach anatomy for the general public. Uh, and for the Southeast Asia, we don't have a museum like this, but uh, in the European countries the, and the Australia or the New Zealand, they, find, uh, they keep these uh, exhibitions. So it's just a matter of creating our own specimens uh, and we can in future, if we want, then we can go ahead with uh, exhibition also. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sajis, for that very intriguing presentation. Next is the launch of yet another publication by Dr. Sajit Ediri Singh, titled Simplified Atlas of neuroanatomy. Let me invite Dr. Sajid Atiri Singh to commemorate the launch of the publication by presenting the very first copy to Professor Suranga Lassavardhana, Senior Professor in Anatomy and Dean of the Faculty of Dental Sciences, University of Sri Jayavadhanapura, Sri Lanka. A great mentor to our author, Congratulations, Sajid. May I invite you to deliver the vote of thanks? Okay, okay. So um, let me also invite uh, our dignitaries present here today, Professor Madhuvanti Desanayaka, Professor Ajit Malalasekara, and Dr. Chandana Athapattu to present um, the very first few copies of our publication. Professor Madhuvanti Desanayaka.
Professor Ajit Malasekara. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, sir. And Dr. Chandana Atapattu. Can we have a student representative, Dr. Dulanja, to... 